Hey there, my name is Erin Deal, and I'm a half Southern, half Midwestern mama, some call this voice a nasal twang, who took $5,000 to build and scale a one of a kind experiential organization that improves the lives of corporate professionals through personal development, humanity, and humor. Along the way, I've built client relationships with some of the most notable companies in the country, all while attracting a rock star team of experts and hilarious facilitators. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Well, what I didn't tell you is that my resume also includes a long list of comedy shows I bombed, improv teams I didn't make, companies who told me no, and many a heartache when it came to becoming a mother. I want to show you the real deal of the grit, creativity, and determination it takes to overcome your disappointments, embrace the suck, and design the career you could only dream about. I believe we all have our own unique gifts that we bring to the world, and it is our mistakes that help to unwrap them. Welcome to Failed It. Welcome to the Failed It podcast, the podcast that reminds you, you have to fail in order to improve. I'm Erin Deal, the founder of Improve It and your host, and today, Failed It family. I am so stinking excited to have my friend, our guest, Amani Roberts on the show. Welcome, Amani. Thank you very much for having me, Erin. I'm so honored and happy to be here chatting with you. I'm so excited too. Thank you very oh, much. No, thank <laughs> you. Do you hear my golf clap? That was my golf I clap did. for you. I did. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Amani, I got to toot your horn for a minute. So, um, usually I start off, we go right into your failed it resume, but I got to toot to some Amani Roberts here because this man <laughs> is the real deal. Take my last name. You deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me just share with you, failed it fam, a little bit about Amani. So, Amani Roberts is a Washington, D.C., born and bred creative. He is a graduate of Howard University who has been a DJ since 2008. Ladies and gents, we have a DJ in our midst. Um, his hospitality career has spanned over 25 years, holding jobs such as hotel general manager, director of sales and marketing, and regional director of sales and marketing with Marriott Inter- International, which I, I didn't tell you this, Amani, but I was a, I'm a, a card-carrying Marriott Rewards okay. member. All right, okay. all right. Not not to brag. Um, now, he currently lives in Los Angeles, California, and he is the chief musical curator for his company, The Amani Experience. Now, this company specializes in providing music for corporate events, social events, team building experiences, creating original music for commercials or videos, and teaching students of all ages how to DJ. This is the coolest freaking thing. So (laughs) now I may, okay, so listen to this. This gets better. He has produced remixes of artists such as Nia, Kalani, Ellie Golding, Camila Cabello. Let me say that. I love her. Little Big Town, Alicia Cara, and Hood Boy for his music collective known as A Starter Jacket. Now, DJ Amro hosts a weekly podcast called the Amani Experience Podcast, where he interviews creative professionals from all over the world about why they took the leap from corporate life to the creative life. Now, he's also, to round him out, okay, just like you need more, uh, an adjunct professional, an adjunct professor at Cal State University, Fullerton, which is CSUF. Um, He teaches entertainment money management in the Mahalo School of Business and Economics, as well as he is the co-creative director for the Center for Entertainment and Hospitality Management. Now, he has been an active board member of the Meeting Professionals International Southern California District for over five years, and he is currently the vice president of education for the chapter. Not to mention, his first book, DJs Mean Business, One Night Behind the Turntables Can Spin Your Company Success, was released in April of 2020. Amani, two freaking two to welcome again. Do you feel your cheeks get turning pink? 
Yes, they're bright pink. I feel the love. Thanks for that great introduction. That was that was amazing. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of a big deal. People <laughs> should feel, I feel honored. I mean, so let me just share with, I call our listeners the Failed It fam. So with the Failed It family, um, how you and I met, which I think is important. So I, Amani, we've known each other for two years. Okay. Um, when we first met, I was knocked up, AKA pregnant. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, we met through our dear friend and also a past, uh, failed at guest, Judy Holler. Yes. And you were in Chicago and you were DJing her book launch party. Uh, and you asked me to be a guest on your podcast, the Amani experience. And not only were you the most prepared interviewer I've ever had, <laughs> I feel I have nervous armpit sweat knowing how <laughs> prepared you are. Um, but he came to do the interview with me in person. So not to mention that you also made me into a cartoon character, <laughs> um, which you do for all your guests, which is the coolest thing. So check out the Imani experience. He legit has for his show art cartoons of him with his guests. It's so cool. Uh, I've never felt cooler. And Imani, I just want to thank you for being the most thoughtful human. And I hope that today's show is half as good as yours. You're on mine, so it, it'll be good. But your show is great. So thank you for being here yet again. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> we have good stories already. <laughs> so many good stories. I mean, I, I truly, and somehow I stumbled across. So when we recorded your show, I stumbled across the YouTube of us recording your oh, show yeah, in person. Yeah. And my bump was clearly hidden under the table. <laughs> but there was... That was my son in there, and now he's <laughs> yeah. he's he's thirteen months. So well, congratulations, crazy. congratulations! <sighs> Thank you. But back to you, back to you. So you are a DJ, a team builder, an entrepreneur, and an author. Out of all of those things, what would you say is your favorite? Oh, DJing by far. That's my love. DJing, playing music for people. And then, you know, remixes. As you mentioned, a lot of the remixes and music production. That would be my second favorite. But everything that I do comes back to the DJing. It all connects. And so that's that's my love right there. Oh, I love it so much. I don't know if you know this, <laughs> but I had a, I think I told you this. I had like a small stint in DJing at Lux Bar in the Gold Coast of Chicago, when I was like 25, I had two CD turntables. Yeah, mm -hmm. CDJs, okay. Yep, and basically I just put CDs in, in like <laughs> 2006. And then I would just like spin it, like it was like, Rrr! and you know, act like I knew what I was doing. And literally my friend was the manager of Lux Bar. She's like, could you just do this on Saturday nights? And I did it for like six months. And it was really fun, but it was not in any way, shape or form um, technological or crafty. It was just literally me playing Britney Spears, Toxic, and <laughs> um, probably Black Eyed Peas. Yes. Tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, I forget their main song, which is, which is a pump. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But this brings me to my next question for you. What's your favorite song right now that you're that you're spinning? Okay, that's a great question. I have two. Uh, I'll say so. It's Skip Marley and Her. I forget the title of the song. I can look it up, but it's it's their duet. That's one of my favorites. And then Don't Waste Your Time with Usher and LMA. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have to like. I feel non cool, so I'm gonna have to look <laughs> both of those up. So if I'm, I'm like, oh, like I knew it. I didn't. So I'm gonna have to look this. <laughs> okay, what? song makes you cringe right now Ooh, what song makes me cringe right now that's a good question hmm you know nothing quite makes me cringe right now i can listen and try to hear the good in most songs so i don't think i can listen i don't think i can list a song that makes me cringe just yet i'm trying to think but nothing quite comes to mind Okay, that's fair. That is fair. That is fair. What if, like, you're DJing a wedding, and which I know you don't do a lot of, but what if you were DJing a wedding and they're like, play this song? What song would you be like, oh, God, here it Ooh. goes? Yeah, you get those requests all the time. Like YMCA. I love YMCA, but I don't want to play it anymore. That's a popular yeah. one. You know, we love our classic rock, but, you know, I mean, yeah, I've, you know, what's the, the Bon Jovi? Like, we hear it all the time. So we, we want to hear something new. Let's hear something new. Those would be two that I'd you. be like, you know, let's pick something else. How about that? 
That's fair. That is fair. That is fair. I know. All right. So not to not to stick on the negative. Okay. Not to stick there. But I want I want us to think. Um, I want us to fast forward really quick. We're in 2020 when we're recording this episode. Um, and somebody is listening to the replay of this episode of Failed It in 2025. What would you say your biggest takeaway from 2020 is? This is this is getting to the real stuff. I, I loosened yeah. you up. You did. What would you I here we go. Loose, loose. Boom, hit your heart. What would you say your biggest takeaway from 2020 is? I, I would say take time to slow down, but don't stop doing work or improving and getting better. I think it's okay to slow down, but still try to continue to improve, get better, learn. Um, we were forced, of course, to pretty much stop what we were doing, and many people chose to just kind of check out. And I would hope that people would listen to this five years from now and understand that even when we're forced to slow down or stop, still try to do things to improve yourself, acquire new skills, learn something new. I think that's going to be my biggest takeaway from 2020. I love it. Have you tried anything new this year that you wouldn't? Tried plenty new. Yes. Yes, I have. I, I know a few of them. Share with our listeners. What would you say the coolest new thing you've done is? The coolest new thing absolutely is live streaming. And so mm. live streaming DJ sets, but also live streaming my podcast episodes because, you know, there's no editing. So it is what it is out there on the video. And then the DJing sets, like we were talking before in the green room, we were talking mm -hmm. about how I've today it will be 32 straight days. I've live streamed the DJ set and that is um, a lot of work, but it's definitely stretched me in terms of my DJ uh, skills my video production skills, the live streaming skills, I'm acquiring a skill set now that I can use moving forward because I don't think live streaming is going away. I think it's going to be a part of kind of how we live moving, moving forward and just building a community. And every day you try something new, it works, it doesn't work. Um, and you just keep learning and going forward compared to say some of my DJ colleagues, peers that are they're scared. They're scared to try something. They're scared to dip their toe because the technology, something's always going to go wrong. And they're maybe scared of how they're going to look if something goes wrong. But what I found is that actually your viewers and the people that follow you, they kind of like the imperfections that lets people know that you're real, that you're not a robot and that every, everything is not pre-planned. So that's what I say. The live streaming has been the biggest thing so far in 2020 that I've, that I've learned. I love it so much. And I've, I told you, I've joined a couple of your lives and I'm like, yes, get it. <laughs> and, I, and, uh, and just so you know, Instagram live is what he's talking about. So if you're on Instagram, um, we will definitely have you plug at the end of the show where to find you, what times for your lives, because he is such a great DJ and just a great human. So you've got to check that out. Yeah. More, actually, um, more, more so Twitch. Twitch has been the oh, biggest right. learning. More so Twitch than Instagram. Instagram cuts you off. So they kind of are second after thought but twitch is a platform that really it used to be you know primarily people think of for gamers but mm -hmm. what i've learned on that platform in the last five or six months because i teach it we have a whole two weeks that we talk about twitch at cal state fullerton and this is the first time i've actually been in it using it and the things i'm teaching is true and it's it's been such a learning experience it's crazy i love it and i think i want to talk to you about what you said too about essentially the grace that you're saying you feel like people are giving each other this year um, because we all have had to pivot and try new things. And I remember being on an Instagram live that I was hosting and literally my internet cut off. We had, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I'm like my 10 followers or no, I'm just kidding. My, like the people that were watching it all went away and we had to restart the live and I lost that footage. And it was with a guest of ours from one of our failed it shows and I just was like, listen, like this is 2020. And I think people rejoined and it's just what happens. Like you, technology is going to fail us. But the fact that you are trying something new and you've been doing it since the pandemic stopped or started, I should say, has not stopped. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> it is not. It's so cool. And I'm so proud of you. And, and you know, you and I have... I've I've watched you DJ a keynote. You're doing some <laughs> corporate stuff, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. So if you've got uh, any type of event or any type of something conference wise that you're planning virtually, it's really cool to have um, DJ Amani Amro on your corporate uh, corporate platform there, which I think I would have never thought of. And I and yeah. I love that I now have you as that resource to kind of 
guidance, stuff like that. So I want to stick on this topic really quick, and then I want to get to your failure resume. But with 2020, there has been so much um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And how would you say that we as a nation have failed at addressing the racial injustice that's been going on in our country for hundreds of years? But how would you say that that's come to the forefront really in 2020? How, what would you say about that? I would say, you know, in terms of how we failed is that many times there'll be different instances where we see people shot unarmed, people arrested, just murders in the street. And I think that there's uproar for a week, two weeks, three weeks. But now you're seeing people consistently asking, you know, have they arrested the people who murdered Breonna Taylor? You know, have they have they brought the cops to justice that, you know, had things to do and watched George Floyd get murdered. So I think that now we're starting to see people keep the topic at top of mind. And what I'm looking forward to seeing and seeing how we can accomplish this is just action. There's a lot of talk, yeah. there's a lot of talk, a lot of demonstrations, but what kind of actions are we taking taken that are going to be continued to be observed and pursued over a consistent time period, not one week, one month, six months, but like years. What kind of action are we taking so that over the course of years, things will change? And so that's kind of what we're looking forward to, because now we've we've seen where people recognize there's an issue. And let's see what actions can we take on a consistent basis so that we can change this, because it's, it's, an, it's not enough anymore just to talk about it and recognize that as an issue. But what can we do to take action over a consistent period of time to make some definite changes to how we live as a country? I love that. I love that. And I think exactly what you said is absolutely right. The fact that, you know, we are acknowledging it and that it just isn't, perfor- you know, performance based anymore. I think the people are actually continuously calling into those different numbers that they can actually create change, that people are signing petitions, that people are wanting to help and take action is what we need to continue to to, to talk about and bring to the forefront of of our minds as people and, and human beings in society in 2020. So thank you for addressing that because I think when I look back on 2020, that's a big piece of the year for me too. I've learned a lot and I want to continue to learn. So I want to talk about you and your, first of all, amazing career that you've had and continue to have. But you know that's not the title of this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so let's talk about, if you could, I read off this beautiful bio. What are two of the most detrimental failures that you've had along this amazing path as an author, a DJ, an entrepreneur, a professor? What would somebody who has never looked at your resume or LinkedIn bio want to know? And what what two failures do you think would make the most impact on our listeners today? I think the first one that comes to mind is that when I started DJing, I was self-taught. And then I made a decision based on a recommendation from one of my best friends to go to DJ school. So I went to DJ school called Scratch Academy. It's a school based here in um, LA. It was started in New York City by Jam Master Jay, who was Run DMC's DJ. Uh, unfortunately, he was murdered six months after he started the school, but they kept it going. And ironically, just the last week, they've actually arrested people for his murder eight or nine years later, or I think wow. it's 12, 12 or 13 years later. So I went to Scratch Academy. It's like it's very intense. You go through the entire program. There comes a time when you have to pass each class to advance to the next level. It's about a year long. I, I get to what's called scratching or mixing 505, which is the final class. You have to do five different sets. You mix through five different sets. Your final exam, they give you the time slot of where you're mixing at a club. You have to mix for 20 minutes. There's all sorts of rules. At the end of the class, you have to get a 320 out of 400 to pass. I ended up getting a 318 out of 400. So I didn't mm-hmm. pass. Missed it by mm-hmm. two points. And so as you mentioned in my resume, you know, I'm used to being like a high achiever, you know, all-state soccer player, a general manager of a hotel at age 23. So I'm used to, you know, being the best at things at a young age. And this time I didn't, I was not. So I had to sit there. I remember driving down the 405 and going to reception afterwards at the school where people knew you didn't pass. It was very embarrassing, very humbling. Mm. And I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision. Do I want to take my ball and go home and say, forget this? Because many people do that. They, they fail one time and they just say, that's it. It's not for me. I can't take it. Or do I want to go back again, ask for help, 
and then try to pass it again. So I, you know, checked my ego. I said, this was this, this is literally like the turning point to my DJ career. One of the turning points in my life, actually. I said, okay, let's uh, let's take the class. You just take the final class again. Remember, there's no guarantee that you're going to pass because it's all subjective. I could have an off day mixing. I could pick the wrong song. I could just just be terrible. And there have been numerous instances where people will take the class three, four, five times and not pass it because it's that difficult. So I decided to check my ego, ask for help, take the class again, end up getting the one of the highest scores ever and pass, mm. pass, pass the next time. And that was a springboard to really kind of my DJ career starting to take off. It's still been a slow grind, but that was a very, very important uh, failure lesson right there. That'd be number one. Number two, when I'm thinking about it, yeah, I had a very successful career with Marriott, almost 20 years, uh, general manager of a hotel, uh, director of marketing at three hotels, regional director of sales and marketing for the last year and a half. But if I'm being honest, I think I might have stayed there too long because I was afraid. I was afraid of leaving. I was afraid or the golden handcuffs had a hold of me. And I was kind of, you know, I knew I wanted to leave, but I was too secure, too comfortable. And so I think I probably might have stayed too long before going out on my own. So that's kind of the second failure that comes to mind, although it was a very successful career. So that's, I mean, that's what comes to mind. I have a couple others, but I think those are the two most impactful ones on my life. Interesting. Okay. I love both of these and thank you for sharing them, which is, I know it's, you're, you're speaking now. I always say we don't teach from our open scars. We teach from our wounds. So I know you're teaching from a wound, which is like, you're not, you know, which is nice, but let me, I want to talk about this because I think a lot of our listeners right now are corporate America. They are in corporate. They are uh, young professionals. They are mid-level senior leaders in organizations who and some might be, we, we do have some entrepreneurial types who listen to this show, but talk a little bit more about those golden handcuffs. What was sort of, why do you think that you were afraid of taking that leap? And and what would you say was the biggest thing holding you back? I think I was, you know, I, I think I was worried what people would think, you know, worried yeah. what people will think when you leave. Like, how could you leave this great corporate job? You're doing so well. They're grooming you to be the successor to this position. And you're just going to leave to, you know, go DJ, do something creative. I think a lot of people have the mindset, which is incorrect, of the starving artists. Like, all creative people end up being starver, uh, starving artists, which is incorrect. It's very incorrect. Um, so I think that helped me back. I think just, you know... The security of the money, the bonus coming in, the profit sharing, you're three weeks off a, a year, just that security. As you get older, it's very, very hard to walk away from because, you know, when you're younger, you can make kind of more drastic decisions. But once you get to a certain age, you get used to a certain lifestyle and you, to turn it upside down when there's no guarantee. Like with yeah. your job, for the most part, although now it's very different, for the most part, when you have a corporate job, you're pretty pretty secure there. You won't get laid off, although now with COVID, it's very different. People are getting furloughed. But that's what held me back is just security, really worried about what people would think, worried about how it looked if I went out, tried it, and had to come back with my tail between my legs and, and was a, a failure. And so I had to come crawling back to the corporate life. I think those three things held me back. And it prevented me from leaving much sooner than I did. Mm, I love that. Okay, so I'm gonna ex I want to take this into context a little bit for because I love what you do now. You've taken that learning experience and created your podcast around it. You interview people who have left corporate for the creative yes. world, and that's so cool. Let me ask you this. In improv, we say there are no mistakes, only gifts, and we classify failures as gifts. Because if we're on stage and somebody makes a mistake or somebody says something that's not supposed to be a part of that scene, that's not a mistake. We add that into the scene. It becomes a part of that scene. So applying that to life is really cool. If you can take that same concept of gifts and apply them into your life. So let me ask you, if you had three action items for our listeners, our Failed It fam here today, to improve themselves based on off of your gifts, I'm doing air quotes, what would you say those three action items would be? If somebody else is listening and they're like, man, he thought he was going to fail at leaving this corporate job. He, you know, what would you say if they wanted to take action immediately, you would tell them to do three things? I think the first thing to do is to try to find 
your tribe, you have to find a strong group of people to surround yourself with who are there to support you in the tough days, who are there to be honest with you, give you advice, but also cheer you on. Because when you choose to leave the corporate life, it can be a very lonely world. Entrepreneurship in general is a very lonely, isolating world. And mm-hmm. so I think it's very important to have a strong group of people that are around you to support you and keep you you know, going. I also think that we we kind of underestimate the importance of reading, but I think if you can read and read people's stories and learn from people's stories and how they got through different experiences and what they did to navigate tough, tough, tough waters, I think that's extremely important. I think that, and then also always be working on like a new skill that you're learning that can help you improve as a person, both personally and professionally. It could be something that's totally unrelated to, you know, what you want to do. It could be like, you want to learn how to sew, you want to learn how to dance the salsa, you want to learn how to cook. But all, it, I find that when you pick a new skill to learn, that inspires you and activates a different part of your brain. It just really kind of keeps you balanced. And it really opens you up to learn and be open to even more opportunities as they come up to learn, to say yes. So those would be three action items I think people should take right away. I love it. So, okay, find your tribe. Yes. Read about past people. And that's what I love, too. I love to hear how people got where they are. That's my favorite type of reading. So that's number two. And number three is really just find a new skill. Do something that may surprise you, which I really, really love. Um, So if you're listening today and you're stuck and you're trying to find yourself in a transition or you're you are in a transition and you maybe want to be in a transition, but you feel stuck where you're at. Listen to those three items because you've really made a career out of that. You've made a career out of leaving corporate America and finding creative space. And you've encouraged people to do the same through the Imani Experience podcast, through the work you're doing with your DJ sets and team building your book, So I think that that is very cool. And I think people listening today can take that to heart immediately. So thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank (laughs) you. All right. I'm talking Southern. I don't know why. All right. (laughs) Hey, Failed It fam. Do you have what the kids call Zoom fatigue? Are you sick of logging on Zoom and hearing things like, can you see my screen? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. And oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I'm late. Are you working from home in your bedroom slippers and business mullet like me, which I'm talking about wearing a business top and yoga pants on the bottom, feeling like it's Groundhog's Day every single day? Do you need some laughter, levity, and fun in your workday to change things up while remote? How about a laugh break? That's right. It's called Laugh Break, and it's Improve It's newest virtual offering. Laugh Breaks bring seasoned Chicago and Charlotte-based improvisers into your virtual conference call for a little taste of short-form improvisation. In each session, improvisers engage on live, on-the-spot games based on your team's laughter and suggestions. Now, whether your team needs a quick 15 minutes of laughter or a more substantial 30-minute break, Improve It has got your back. You can go to www.learntoimproveit.com backslash laugh break, or just click on the link in our show notes to book yours on demand today. Again, that's learntoimproveit.com backslash laugh break. Get ready to sit back, relax, and grab some giggles because we could all use a little laugh break right now. See you on the Zoom. Okay, I have a question for you. After you have, you know, thought through these failures, what would you say, obviously, I'm the founder of Improve It. It is whatever you want it to be. Improve your it, whatever that means. What would you say after learning from these gifts or failures is your it or your life's purpose? Uh, So it took me a while to get here. But I definitely think that, like, I really love to teach. You know, I grew up uh, the son of a professor at Howard University, and I wanted to be as far away from teaching as possible, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. is why I I chose business. But, yeah, you kind of, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In In this case, it was a tremendous honor. I just really think that I'm here now to teach people, teach students, young and old, about, um, 
specifically, I'll say the creative industry, more specifically like the music entertainment industry, so that they can ha- make like intelligent decisions about their career, having as many opportunities as possible. I found just through teaching people how to DJ, teaching my students at Cal State Fullerton, that there's a lack of knowledge about the right thing. So for example, in the music industry, if you're an independent artist, there is so much to learn so that you can get your royalties, you can get paid, you can put out the music, protect yourself with copyright. And there's not a lot of information out there for them. So you're like learning it on the fly. You miss out on a significant amount of money. And I feel that as I continue to get more entrenched into the music industry and DJing, that it's my purpose to be a, like a teacher, almost like a, a little bit like a Yoda for people, to learn how to take care of their business, whether they're a student, whether they're a professional, whether they've been in the game for many years, and just show them the resources and teach them how to take care of their careers. So if they choose to work with a record label, that's fine. If they choose to go independent. So I think to summarize that, it's just I'm really here to kind of teach people, increase their knowledge base, and show them what's possible moving forward. I love it. Ah, oh, and isn't it funny? You were like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> I hear true. you on that. I hear you. Yeah. My mom taught piano out of my house my entire existence growing up. And I was like, I will never play the piano. And I didn't. I didn't. But she also taught. And I love to teach as well. And it's so funny when you have somebody in your life who is a, a provider and wants to serve in a way that helps other people. I feel like you try to run from it because you're like, my I don't want to be like them. I'm going to be like my parents, my dad, whatever. And then, you know, it's just ingrained in you. So that is lovely. And I feel that from you, Imani. I think you have this wonderful spirit. And it's so wonderful that you use your gift and share it with the world. So we need you. So don't don't stop. Don't change. Okay? Don't change. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. And this is just, this isn't even a question I really <laughs> planned. I just want to know, what does if you could summarize entrepreneurship in one word, what would you say that word is? So if I was going to summarize the word entrepreneur, how do I summarize that? Yeah. What would you say entrepreneurship means to you in one word? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, one hard. word. One word. Courage. You can do two. Oh, courage. Okay. You can, I was going to give you a hyphen if you wanted a hyphen. I'd say risk-taking or courage would be the better one. Courage. That's it. That's it. Okay. I love that. And do you have, you know, I think of one for talking about myself again, but I, I think about entrepreneurship and sometimes I go to this question that was asked to me one time, but I was sitting on a panel and somebody said, well, how did you know you're supposed to do this with your life? Right. And and I'm going to ask this to you. How did you know you were supposed to do this? I don't think you really know. It kind, of, it kind of finds you and you're kind of making your way through life. Like for me, the first time I decided I wanted to be a DJ was maybe when I was a senior in college. I saw Bismarcky at this club. He was amazing. I said, I want to do that, but I did not have the courage to do it. I thought it was not a legitimate job. So I continued working in corporate America, but somehow, some way it kept popping up in every city I lived in. I finally got a herd to LA and there was a school, the timing was right. And I went to the school and then I had the courage to say, you know what, enough is enough. Uh, it's time to do this. And so I think that, you know, it kind of finds you at the right time and it presents you with an opportunity that you just can't look away from. Like, it'll keep coming to you and you'll be like, okay, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But eventually you'll be like, okay, I need to pay attention to the signs. It's time to go for this because as you know, the cliche saying is you only live once, but yep. I'll, I'll, I'll be damn, excuse my language, if I'm going to look back and be here 15, 20, 25 years and be like, I wish I would have started to DJ back then. Like, you mm. know, I don't want to, you know, look up six months from now and be like, I wish I would have started live streaming now, then, yep. because I could be further along. So that's kind of, it'll find you and then you just have to embrace it and go. I love it. Yes. Okay. Follow up question. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? If I knew I could not fail, I would I would want to sing like as good as Tank or Brian McKnight. 
I would want to do that oh. in, a, in a in a hot second. I'm ready for it. Yes. Oh my god! Can you sing? Can you sing? I cannot sing. No, I try, oh. <laughs> but I can't. But I whoo, that would open up so many different opportunities. So yes, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I I mean truly, so whoever can sing that is true. If you don't use the voice that you're given, that is a mistake. Because I too have that want and desire, and it's like you know, it sounds like a cat screeching over here, and it's just <laughs> you know. What a, what a gift. And I'm with you on that. I, I, I love that answer. Now, let me ask you this. It's, it's four. Well, I'm Eastern time right now. I'll yeah, tell you about yeah. that later, but it's four <laughs> o'clock Eastern. So it's through, it's uh one, one o'clock one, yeah. Pacific. Okay. What did you fail at today? Today? What did I fail at today? If I, huh, let's see here. I'm looking around my place right now. What did I fail at today? You know, uh, I do a horrible job opening my mail, so I feel that that's day for sure. <laughs> I think um, also, if we just rewind a little bit further to last night, when you're DJing a set, going live, maybe you try a certain blend or a certain scratch. It might not work out just how you tried it, but you got to keep going. You got to try again because most of the time people don't know. And then if you keep trying, eventually you're going to get it. So I think I answer that question with two answers right there, the mail and the special blend or scratch. I might have tried that at might not have worked. It might not have been perfect. Um, but That's then as it. we know, perfection is an illusion as well. So just keep going. Uh, I know. What do you think about when you hear the word perfectionism? Yeah, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. I've, you know, and it took me a while to acquire this mindset, but I think perfectionism is a myth and it will hold you back from trying things. Like a lot of times people want to try new things, whether it's writing a book, whether it's DJing a set, whether it's going live, whether it's running a marathon, painting a picture, and they're worried about how it look. It won't be just right, where people just stop because things aren't just right, and that's no such thing. Like, you just have to go. You go and yeah. do it, and it'll, it'll get better. And perfectionism is a myth. You just have to work on being a little bit better than you were yesterday. And if you can have that mindset, then you're going to improve as a person, and you're going to be happier. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, this, <laughs> is, this is my last question before we get to something I call the fail yeah lightning round, which okay. you have no clue is coming. It's going to be fun. <laughs> don't worry. Um, don't, get, don't get nervous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. So, all right. Let me ask you this, which is so cool. And you and I haven't even talked really about this. You wrote a book. Okay. You wrote a book. Did you have... When I think about a book, right, I think these these words will live on on these pages for years. Did you have any fear around creating a book? Were you nervous or were you like what you just said? Let's just go jump all in and do this. What was that process like for you? I definitely had some fear. You know, I, I had a very huge case of the imposter syndrome. I was like, yeah. who am I? Who am I who's been a DJ at that time, like 11, 12 years to write a book when there are much more talented DJs out there who can write a book. There are much more experienced business people that can write a book. But what I was learned is that there's no one who has my journey and my story to DJing that can write this book. And so once I was able to kind of get the imposter syndrome in check, because it never really goes away. It still pops up there. Um, I, then I decided to write the book and I didn't, once I got started, I didn't really have any fear. I was excited. Um, the hardest part of the book was, was writing it. I, th I say one of the, also the hardest parts was the editing it. When I turned it into the editor and then she came back with the edits, um, that was a huge blow to the ego because she tore up the book. Yeah. But. The edits were phenomenal. She gave me some excellent advice about how to write, how to include as many of the five senses as you can when you're telling a story, how to take out certain songs that might not be classics because it could date your book. Just all the advice she told me was phenomenal. And so I applied everything. But honestly, it took me, I got the edits back in, I want to think, I got the edits back like early May. And it took me two months to finish them because I was so hurt by the edits at first that I had to kind of... I just put it off, and then I finally got back to it and finished it two months later, and then there were more edits that kept going. So writing a book is an amazing experience. I'm working on another book right now, and I think that if if anyone has the desire to write a book, I think you should. I read a stat and interviewed someone on my podcast where they said, I think it's like 85% of the people have a book inside of them and are afraid and never write it. Or 85% have a book, in, book inside of them, 5% of the people write it, and then 5% of that 5% actually publish it. Mm, 
write that down, (laughs) write that down. That's for real. I mean, that's, uh, thank you for sharing that. Cause I think a lot of people listening to this can resonate. If, if it's a book, if it's, you know, they want to take a, an improv class, if they're like afraid to start public speaking, if they're afraid to do a presentation within their corporate job, if they're afraid to ask for a raise, I mean, this book process could be applied to so many things. And yeah. imposter syndrome is real. I know there's probably, the most confident person in the world still has imposter syndrome. Yeah. And the fact that you are the 5% who wrote it is amazing. And I think you should be so proud of yourself. I have a, I have a follow-up question to my follow-up question. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Do you write? I'm so, I'm always so curious about this because how as with all the things you have going on, do you find time to write? Do you get up early? Do you do it in the evening? What's your writing process? So right now it's kind of random because I'm taking classes as well. So it's it's a little random. I try to spend like weekends or writing. But the cop the topic that we're covering, this book is just so exciting to me that it's easy to write and it's a lot of research. And then I'll write a story underneath it. So I'll just tell you really quickly, like the topic we're talking about is if you look at black R and B groups from the fifties through early two thousand, there were always black R and B groups in the Billboard top twenty. Whether you go in the 50s with James Brown, you have the 60s, the Isley Brothers, you, you go to the 70s, you have like Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, all these groups here. You have Jackson 5, the 80s, the 90s, SWV, um, who are bigger than I, so many groups bigger than I, like Jodeci, all sorts of boys to men, everyone. Then yeah. you get to early 2000s, 2002 or three. And there was a change in the industry. And no longer do you find black R&B groups in the top 20. It's, it's just a shocking um shift in the cycle. And so we're researching what happened in the history, why has there been a shift, and what do we think is going to happen in the future? And so I have student oh researchers. God. We have, I have student researchers that are helping me with the research. Now we're to like the interview part. Where we're trying to interview different artists and DJs and A and R people and producers to get their input. Then we're going to put it all together and make our predictions for the future. Okay. Can we talk about this on a real level? <laughs> yes, we I'm can. not kidding. This is amazing. <laughs> I kid you not. Okay, so right now, Amani, I'm in South Carolina. My our listeners may know this. I am moving. I'm in the process of moving from Chicago to Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm living with my family, my parents at 37. It feels right. Um, and long story short, my husband's best friend lives here. And it's like our one release is during quarantine, we'll go to his back porch with his wife. We'll sit on their back porch. We'll have some wine, beers, whatever. And we will, this past weekend, we put on a 90s R&B station on Pandora. Yeah. and Or we just said Alexa and we had this 90s R&B. I mean, we had the best night of our lives. And it was exactly like SWV, Escape. Do you remember yeah. Escape? Yeah. Just, just kicking it. Kick it. Kick it. Yeah. Understanding, just, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. 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 Okay, this is. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody turn your volume down. Um, and then, oh my God, we were just living our best lives going from song to song. And I said the same thing. I said, where does this music exist now? Yeah, I, you don't yeah. hear it. And no. I'm so interested to know this because that was what I grew up on. Like I, that music fueled my high school, my middle school. Yeah. I mean, I freaking there is no... Songs it's, like Keith Sweat, no oh, yes. Eh? yes, yes. You go <laughs> earlier, Keith Sweat, make it last forever too. Yes, we, we go, Keith Sweat was over two decades. Yeah, that's so. crazy. <laughs> so it is so true because you don't hear the music today seems far more re like I don't know the right word. It just doesn't seem as pure as as it seemed back then, and it was just such good music that I yeah. loved and I could, I know literally almost every word to. So I think, I think music nowadays, I'll say one thing and then we can continue. Music nowadays is kind of made to be streamed. They want to get you with a quick hook early on. So you stream the song for at least 30 seconds. Oh. So they get paid on it. And I also think that singing about being in love and crooning to a female or male, whomever you love, has kind of gone out of style. And mm-hmm. so it's just, you know, it, usually things work in cycles, so we'll see. But I think that that kind of thing has gone out of style and we need to bring it back because it's needed. And I think if anything this year has taught us is that, you know, you, you want to express your feelings, you want to feel the love. Music, music, we talk about this on Twitch, but like we're not really, but DJs are kind of essential workers. Like music is helping people get through this quarantine in so many ways that have uh. not been talked about. 
I love that. And like Taylor Swift just wrote a whole album in quarantine and released yes. it. What? Um, okay. Yes. This is, I could talk to you about this for hours. <laughs> I am so intrigued. I want to read this book immediately. This is fascinating. Because we we literally had this conversation Saturday yeah. night and we spent, I mean, we were there until midnight singing with, you know, like literally have videos of us just like really feeling this music and just, it just, it, it, there is nothing like it. So I'm oh. fascinated with your research. I can't wait to hear. I'm coming back to failing it. All right. All right. So like all I right. said, this is the fail. Yeah. Lightning round. And this involves <laughs> a little improv, okay. a little thinking quickly on your feet. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions and you have to respond as fast as you can with only one word answers, but no, you can't fail. But if you say more than one word, Together, you and I both will say, fail, yeah. All right. Okay. So, it. you ready? It's one word. I'm going to ask you, let's try to go as fast as we can. <laughs> Are you ready, Amani, for the fail, yeah, lightning round? Yes. Great. You're already nailing it. Here we go. All right. One, <laughs> one word to describe your early career rough. <laughs> one word to describe where you're currently at in your career. Growing. One word to describe your future self. Happy. One word to describe your favorite boss. Intelligent. Oh, one word to describe your least favorite boss. Selfish. Oh, mm-hmm. One word to... De- <laughs> I felt that one. I know that boss. All right. One word to describe your DJ style. Smooth. Ooh! One word to describe the Amani Experience podcast. Creative. And one word to describe this interview. Fun. Yeah! No fail, yes! <laughs> you nailed it! You didn't fail you. it! Oh my Thank God, you. yes! All right, Amani, tell the Failed It family where they can find you, social platforms, podcast, book, all the things. All the things. So you can find me on social media. It's at Amani Experience. So it's like A like Apple, M like Mary, A like Apple, N like Nancy I, the word experience, one word. You can find me on Twitch, twitch.tv backslash Amani Experience. If you want to get the book, you can go to Amazon or Apple Books, wherever you want to get your books from Barnes and Nobles. I'm doing the Audible version later this fall. So you can listen to it soon. Or you go to my website and buy it there and I'll send you a signed copy. And then my podcast, it's on all the podcast platforms, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to your podcast, it's there. We just finished episode 154, so we've premiered our season four. We're, right, we're in our season four right now. Wow. Okay. And we will link to all of that in the show notes. I'm also going to get the audible version of your book for the smooth <laughs> listening. Okay. The smooth <laughs> sounds of Amani. Yes. I love it. All right. So first of all, I want to thank our Failed It family so much for listening and tuning in. Tell me what you want more of based on this episode. You can hit me on the DMs, as the kids say, at Keeping It Real Deal. That's D-I-E-H-L. Or send me an e- uh, email at info at learn to improve it amani i want to thank you for making <laughs> this an experience uh <laughs> one that i will never forget do you see what i did there amani I experience did, yes. i digress yes. <laughs> and in the turntables of life you are a platinum record and i cannot oh. thank you enough for sharing your failures with us awesome <sighs> so big hugs amani and yes. fail yeah fail yes. it fam fail yeah Thank you so much, Aaron. It's been an honor to be on your podcast. I'm so proud of you for doing a podcast and keep going because I know it's not easy. So keep going. I'm just proud to have you as a friend and just keep up the great work. Oh, my God. I love you, Amani. Thank you. <laughs> and you know us work. All right. Yes. We'll see you soon, <laughs> Failed It fam. Bye-bye. Hey, friends. Thanks for tuning in to Failed It. I'm so happy you were along for the ride. And if you enjoyed today's show, head on over to iTunes to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every Wednesday. I'll see you next week, but want to leave you with this thought. What will you fail at today? And how will that help your future successful self? Think about it. I'm proud of you and you are totally failing it. See you next time.